Hey, it's Rev Brad. Welcome. If this is your first time listening, I want to thank you for joining us. You know, each week we're going to take a look at some particular issue regarding faith, family, and football. So I'm glad you're giving us a listen and want to invite you to share us with others. Uh, You know, maybe there's a a player out there or a coach or someone you know in the game that could use some encouragement and support. And that's really what we want to be about in some of the things we talk about and some of the things we get into. Well, if you didn't know it, a couple weeks ago, the North American Soccer League, or the NASL, announced that they were shutting down for the 2018 season. You know, for a long time, the the NASL has been sort of the the storied league of soccer here in America. Uh, I remember there were stars like Pelé and Franz Beckenbauer and Johan Cruyff and George Best. These these guys were filling some of these teams and and bringing a, a really a game that most of America didn't know much about. And they're putting it on display. And it's really sad news to hear that they won't be playing for 2018. And it remains to be seen whether they're, they'll be able to pick things up again at all. But as I reached out to some of the people that I know in the NASL, uh, some of the players and coaches and staff, it, the messages and the comments that I heard back really broke my heart. Um, you, you know, some said, hey, thanks, Rev, for reaching. The, the wife and kids are moving back in with the family until I can figure out the next team. Others said, hey, Rev, I'm, I'm thinking of retiring. Others said, we're out of insurance at the moment. We're not sure what to do. Please pray for us. And, and others just simply said, yeah, just looking for the new club, new opportunity, and kind of brush it off as if this just happens every day, or it's just business as usual. But as I got to thinking about the NSL shutting down for the season, it, it brought up this important topic of displaced people. You know, if you do the math, by the time you add up all the different people that surround or, or are part of a particular team or organization, you have close to three or 400 people who suddenly have been directly impacted by the news. It's not just soccer players who are out of a job, but it's coaches, front office staff, stadium staff. They and their families and, and everyone kind of around are all affected and they, they eventually become displaced. You know, when I think about displaced people, I immediately think about some of the things that are going on in the larger context of of the world right now. Around the globe right now, there's there's an epidemic, there's a crisis where it seems like so many different people groups are on the move and they're fleeing their home countries, they're fleeing everything that they've known, everything that they've worked for, and either they're trying to find a better life, they're, they're running away from violence, or... Um, maybe there's a, a natural catastrophe or disaster that's forced them to move on with they and their families. And, and the pictures are stunning. They're, they're difficult to see at times when you, when you see just, you know, tattered clothes and a, and a suitcase on someone's back. And that's all that they have left in the world besides maybe some family or friends that are journeying with them. I think also when I think about displaced people, I think about the multiple times in the Bible when we read about displacement. And as I started to think more about this, it struck me that the Bible might be entirely about a displaced people. Our first story, the first story in the Bible is about displacement, Adam and Eve. They're forced to leave the Garden of Eden. They essentially trade paradise for a, a difficult environment. They, they have to work until the ground and, and it and God says, hey, look, this is going to be tough. You're going to have blood, sweat, and tears to just try and get the land to produce something for you. Or another story, Jacob and his family, they're forced to migrate to Egypt due to famine. Later on, Jacob and that family, they become a nation and they're enslaved by Egypt. They flee Egypt to get away from the slavery and oppression that's happening. Or even, you know, maybe those stories aren't as familiar, but, but a story like David, you know, David and Goliath, we hear that great story. Uh, David was anointed to be king, and yet he had to live for some 20-odd years fleeing from King Saul, hiding in caves, living in the wilderness, roving about with his his band of, of close brothers and friends, his fighting men. They had to live life on the run. Another story, perhaps one of the, the best stories, is the story of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. You know, they journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And all due in part to a census. It's, it's for political reasons that they have to uproot and move. And then from Bethlehem to Egypt, they're, they're running from Herod, who's on the hunt. He's killing innocent boys, trying to find this Jewish Messiah. And then eventually, once Herod dies, they journey back from Egypt to Nazareth. Once things have settled down and they're, they're finally able to, to be at home again 
And by the time we read about Jesus in scripture, he's, he's right around the age of 12 years old when he's finally seemingly to be in a, a, a normal sort of circumstance for a kid. I think that's why maybe one of the most poignant statements about displacement comes out of Jesus's own mouth. He says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. That's in Matthew 8, 20, if you want to look it up. You know, I think one of the most difficult parts of the footballing life is that it's tremendously transient. It's a, it's a nomadic lifestyle. It, it produces so many displaced people. Some of the players that I know have gone through as many as five or six different teams in the span of their career. I think the record right now is held by Sebastian Abreu. He's a Uruguayan, 41 years old. He's played for some 26 different clubs in a 23-year professional career. That's 11 different countries. I, I can't imagine the moving expenses if we were to tally it all up. What, what would that bill look like? Uh, coaches, too, they tend to live out this nomadic lifestyle. Uh, I read somewhere that the average lifespan of a coach in the EPL in, in England is about two and a half years. And, uh, and, and that's saying something. I, I think the EPL is where it's, where it's actually not as low as, as in the lower divisions in England. Staff, too, they might even be more on the move depending on their position or their place. A lot of the sales folks that I know that have worked in, in soccer front offices don't even last a full season before they're looking for better pay or a different position or a different job altogether. So what does all this matter? Isn't this just soccer, sports, just a results-oriented business as we've heard maybe so many times? Like, who really cares? What does this matter? Well, as a chaplain, this is one of the things that burdens my heart the most. You know, one of the values I try to bring is, is a presence to the teams that I serve, a presence that's consistent and constant. And it's one of the things that I coach many people in the soccer world and community about, whether they're players or coaches, staff members, or, or their families. I try to encourage them to find those things which are transcendent from the game. You know, sometimes transcendence can be experienced in, in our family or in friends, or, or sometimes we can feel a transcendent moment in a hobby or developing another passion. Let me back up. What am I talking about transcendence for? Well, I think sometimes when we're displaced, we're, we're looking for stability. We're looking for familiarity. And we can't find those things sometimes in the face of the environment that we're in as a soccer player or a coach or a staff member. And so by finding something that's transcendent. What we're looking for is we're looking for something that doesn't change. It's not, it's not like a blowing of the wind, but it's constant. It doesn't move. It's fixed. It's reliable. It's dependable. In truth, only in God can we find someone who's truly transcendent, truly unchanging. Listen to these words. 1 Samuel fifteen twenty nine: He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. For he is not a human being that he should change his mind. You know, Samuel right there is talking about something that that I think we need to understand, especially given these contexts of displacement and, and moving about all the time. You know, you can get into a situation where a coach or a boss changes their mind all of a sudden. There's a different direction. There's a different way that, that the team or organization want to go. And all of a sudden, you find yourself on the outside looking in. God doesn't change. He doesn't change his mind. He's, he's not like us. And Samuel's getting, getting that out and getting that across to people. And James says it this way, James 1.17, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. You know, I think in this environment, we need to realize that many things can change. A coach can change, a team can change its philosophy or formation, an organization can can change where it decides to office all of its people. Our families can change. Our children grow up. Our, our friends move on. They, they, they change in different seasons of the life. But in a world full of change, full of displacement, we need, to know, we need to have comfort and reassurance that there is one who does not change. You know, right now, as I mentioned, there's this global crisis around the issue of displacement. A couple of years ago, the UN put out a report that some 65.3 million people were displaced from their homes by conflict and persecution in 2015. 65.3 million people. 
you know, they, they averaged that out. It was like one person in every 113 had been displaced. And we've put names to this now. We, we know about Syria. We, we know about the Rohingyas and Guatemalans and so many people groups that are on the move and fleeing, looking for a different opportunity, a different country, a, a safe place. They're looking for a home because they can't call what they knew home to be home anymore. And disappointingly, they have no place to lay their head. They have no place to call home. Well, maybe you can count yourself among the displaced of the world. And whether it's due to conflict or natural disaster or a soccer league folding up or a company moving their headquarters, I just want to encourage you today that God never changes and he will provide for you. He'll provide for you those good, perfect gifts. Look to him. Pray to him. Know that he doesn't change. This is The Rev coming to you from the touchline.